Hello and welcome to Tunfall Helmets, your occasional spicy hot take roundup of the latest F1 rumours, all with the most believable conspiracy theories to back them up. Everything here is carefully researched for hours to make sure it is totally founded in logic, reason and truth. Or not. Who knows? So Andrew, should we go straight into uh, have we got anything right? I mean, that's where we start. That's where we start. Uh, so rain in Canada. It rained in Canada. Yeah. It did. It did not rain on race day. Yeah, not during the race. Uh, but we got uh, we got wet practice. We got broken CCTV practice. And we got re- wet quality in the way that always makes it so interesting, where it dries out or gets wet halfway through it and completely screws everybody's strategy. Yeah, and, and to be fair, I'm totally okay with like wet quality draw, dry race because you get the cars out of position and then you get kind of a little bit more of an exciting race. Indeed. Uh, second one on the list, Debris or Sergeant will put it in the Wall of Champions. Oh, I was wrong. That did not happen. They didn't even bend it. I, I did like the AWS graphic, though, of Akon was 11 centimeters away from hitting the Wall of Champions. I did. I, I thought that was great, and I feel like we need that at more tracks where this happens because I think that's... It's it's almost enough. It's like it's like second to driver of the day. Who got the closest to it most consistently? I like that. I think we need more of that. Well, then you had like Monaco where Max was like kissing the corners or the wall in every single yes. corner in sector oh, three. Was... It's like Max is negative one centimeters away from the wall. Indeed. It's when you can move the wall and then you make it great for your next lap where you've got an even straighter line. Uh, number three, Perez will continue to repeat this period of last year by underperforming by breaking the car. I was mostly right with this. He did not break the car. He was just terrible. Uh, he was just terrible. He lucked out, I think, in the end. I think he managed to... The strategy kind of worked for him. Uh, but yeah, pretty bad. Uh, so I'm going to continue to believe that he starts strong in the season, screws it up in the middle, and then peaks at the end, and we're all, we're all laugh for it. Does Montreal count as a street circuit? No. Most people were saying it was not a street circuit. I think it should count as a street circuit because they counted Australia as a street circuit. And Australia is just the same track. It's similar sort of vibes, isn't it? It's kind of like a, a purpose-built circuit, but like during the not times they're racing, like normal people can go drive on it. I mean, I guess the Montreal roads lead to virtually nowhere. I think it's like a hiking, walking, biking trail. Uh, and, and, you know, at least in Australia, you can go around the lake. I think you could try going around. You can go around this lake if you get in the, in a boat and go around the lake. Does that go in the lake? I don't know. Uh uh, anyway, I, I couldn't find any raft race results. I think they canceled it with the rain. These people, they can't. You're already wet. Why does it make any difference? Exactly. Uh, next one on the list. Merck will be back in fifth and sixth. Uh, I was wrong. All uh, right, Dominic. How, how well does Merck have to do for you to accept that these upgrades actually worked? Uh, I think both drivers need to be fighting each other for the top three places. I will accept that they maybe can't fight for it with Red Bull, but they have to be ahead of everybody else and they have to be able to do it for at least three races in a row. So I'll have to eat my hat after Austria. I, I just want to point out that Lewis said in the cool down room that they are terrible in slow speed corners and this track is filled with slow speed corners and Austria is filled with high speed corners. Well, we'll find out, won't we? Uh, I, I, you know, I'm starting to, I'm starting to admit that maybe the upgrades have really worked. Um, but I have a theory about that we'll talk about in the spicy takes uh, that is uh, makes this suggest that maybe it's not really the car. Um, next one, I think, was you, which was uh, Williams in the points. Yep, Alex Albon. Of course, not Logan Sargent, but Alex Albon getting up there. They passed Alpha Tauri now to be ninth in the championship. One really? Point, yep, one point behind Haas, two points behind Alfa Romeo. They're going to screw their tunnel time at this rate. That is beautiful. But think about the money. Like, Dolaton is finally going to be able to start, you know, reaping the rewards of having a team that's successful. So uh, that's, I I was surprised by the performance we'll talk about in the race, but um, I would not have expected this, and it seems to be working out well for them. Uh, Who had the comment of classic Alex Albon defending? Oh, that was great. We have to talk about that. That was James. That was James Valson. I wasn't quite sure what he said. Um, Okay. Next item. Safety car. We had a safety car. Was it it two? One was the ESC. We had a virtual safety car for Logan. And we had a full safety car for George smacking a wall. Okay. Shaking his ass and twerking it like a twerky thing. Okay, so that was all of our predictions. I think that was a that was a pretty good hit. We got one, two, three, four out of one, two, three, four, six. That's pretty good. That's a seventy-five percent hit rate. No, two thirds. 
I can't do math. I'm very bad at this. Uh, so that's pretty good. Let's. Have you considered a job in Ferrari's strategy department? I have, because I think I could be better than they are. Um, well, let's see. Let's see. Do they still have a job? In our occasional segment, does Blah still have a job? I love this uh, segment. It's my favorite segment. Is it, it's your favorite segment? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, actually, I noticed we are missing a participant this week. That's interesting. But let, let's go through the list and discuss the participant that seems to be missing. The original creator of the segment. Uh, so we've got Nick. Nick DeVries. Uh, he actually raced. He seemed to actually be driving and fighting with people on the track. Straight Ooh, down an not... escape... Yeah, and off the track. Straight down the escape roads. Yeah, it's perfect. It's great. Uh, I was waiting to see when that happened, whether there was going to be like... Is, was there a strategic play about if I take longer, maybe I'll convince the other driver to make take the long way around. Um, but yeah, I think that... I, I don't know if it saved him, um, but it's at least finally seeing that you can actually maybe drive a race car. I, I think it's one of those things of like... And we can talk about it more in like the race recap, but like... The Alphas not, or the the Alpha Tauris, like they are not the worst car on the grid, but but they do not have any pace to get into the points. Like they are just. Uh, Otmar, uh, I don't think there's anything to talk about Otmar this week. I I I think he might be safe. I'm not sure I like that. I don't really like Otmar, uh, but he didn't do anything bad this week. His team didn't do anything bad this week, um, and the team that car seemed to drive and it did. A Pretty reasonable. Maybe it was a bit unreliable, but it seemed to work. So he's definitely uh, the hotel art of team principles. The hotel. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yes, I will agree with that. He he is uninspiring. He, but you know, you're not going to be offended by him. It, it's not going to be the best thing you've ever seen. But like, it'll work. It it decorates a wall. Is it hotel art or is it IKEA art? I don't know about that. That's a difficult but, call. They're, they're in the same vein, though, that's for certain. Indeed. Uh, so, next is, does Lance still have a job? Oh, I think he's getting perilous at this point. Yeah, Lance, Lance Stroll definitely still has a job. I think the bigger question for this one is, Lawrence Stroll, the most disappointed father in his son on this Father's Day. Yeah, I don't think he gave his father the gift that his father was hoping for. He did get points, thanks to a Lando Norris penalty. For unsportsmanlike conduct. I still don't know what that was about. Uh, but yeah, I think he's very disappointed, and I still think it's, uh, I don't think Lance has done himself any favours. He might still have a job only because it's the family business, but it's getting close, because at some point, every family fires somebody. Yeah, that's, I, I don't know what they should do about Lance. I, I think, I think the best option for some people is, um, actually, I'll double down on this, because I talked about it last week, I'll, or last race, I'll say it again. I think Ferrari and Aston Martin should swap Charles and Lance. Sainz can be their number one driver, who they seem to want to be their number one driver. Lance is a former member of the Ferrari Driver Academy, so he goes in there. Aston Martin gets Charles and Fernando. I think that's great. Everybody wins. Lawrence doesn't have to fire his son. And then when Ferrari fires his son, he can be like, oh, I'm sorry, I don't have any open seats for you right now. Indeed, I think that is absolutely the best strategy. I, in some respects, I also think it might be the best to allow Lance to flower in his own um environment rather than under the bright light of his parental concern yeah and i mean at the worst case then uh what aston has a hypercar at le mans right and we throw lance in that indeed uh, after ferrari did quite well last week uh speaking of ferrari uh does ferrari strategy team does ferrari even as a whole team still have a job well they must have been talking to the le mans strategy team because you know, right after that safety car, I thought they were screwed and they pulled it out. They did seemingly make the right strategy call. But the question is, is did they, was it really because of the Le Mans strategy team? Or in fact, were the Le Mans strategy team also equally making bad calls? Well, they won Le Mans, so. Well, that's not necessarily because of their strategy. Did they win in spite of their strategy? Uh, no, I, I, I mean, Le Mans was a whole weekend ago, so I've kind of forgotten what happens. But I think they actually made good strategy calls during Le Mans. Okay, maybe they did then. Maybe they did. Um, yeah. Did you watch any of Le Mans? I watched a couple of clips of people crashing, because why else am I going to watch Formula 1? Uh, why else am I going to watch motorsports? Uh, I watched the big V8 motor of the Camaro go around. I, I am still surprised that made it to the end, and it I think it ranked pretty well, didn't it? Uh, 39th. It was up to, I think, in the 20s for a while until they had the gearbox issue that prompted a gearbox change. Driven by Jensen Busson for a chunk of it, I believe. And Jimmy Johnson. I have no idea who Jimmy Johnson is. NASCAR champion. Got it. 
Uh, yeah, I was surprised by that. I thought it looked good. It was hilarious watching it on the in the static pictures it, that I saw. Yeah, the pictures were hilarious. Uh, it was great to like just listen to the commentary for a while because you could tell whenever it passed the commentary booth because it was like new, new, new. It was it was great. It was fantastic. <laughs> I loved it every single time. I suppose in hindsight, I wasn't expecting it to last the whole race, but then you think about NASCAR races actually quite long. There is there is precedence there. So, and I, I uh, hear the crowd was a big fan too. They liked seeing the the stock car go around. Also, the noise! It's yeah. good noise! It was, it was very fun. Uh, and then we have the new entrant this week. I th- or I have added them to the list. Uh, uh, Perez. Uh, does Perez still have a job? New entrant. I'm not sure that, you know, it's quite as uh, close call as Lance or Nick is, but I think it's starting to look a bit silly. I think if you're Perez, you have to be very careful in your simulator sessions right now. So that you don't look worse than Ricardo? Yes, because from what we've heard, Perez is still ahead of Daniel in pace on the simulator. I think I think if that starts to shift and Perez does not pick up his form, I would not be surprised to see a driver swap. Yeah. When would you do it though? How would you how would you how would you get Ricardo the necessary real seat time? Or maybe he doesn't need it because he has driven the new Formula cars and so it's it's not like you're getting a rookie in. You're just getting somebody who's a bit, you know, rusty. I mean, I think it also depends how well the simulator correlates to the actual car. Because if they're doing the same times in the sim that they're doing in the in the car in the same way, and then we know, and Ricardo starts going faster, yeah. And I think I think Daniel's a good choice to throw in the seat, just in the sense of, um, you know, he and Max are, I believe, still pretty good friends. Um, and I think. Daniel's time away from Red Bull has maybe changed his opinion of not necessarily himself, but just like his ambitions. And I think right now he'd be happier, essentially kind of filling that Mark Webber role from the Vettel years, but probably happier than Mark uh, Webber did it. Uh, this this raises a really interesting question. Should we be watching for any unexpected injuries that Perez might obtain during, say, the summer break or some long weekend between races where he, you know, breaks a toe, sprains an ankle, re- sprains his wrist? They go on a bike ride and a tire pump goes through the spokes. We'll know for certain. Indeed. Uh, let's find out. Okay. So the question is, though, we seem to have forgotten about Zach Brown. Uh, he's no longer on the list. Yeah, we pulled him off after Indy because McLaren ran re- really well at Indy, so we figured he's probably safe. He's safe, and based on the performance of McLaren today, uh, I think he did pretty good too. I, it wasn't that was it was pretty good performance given how terrible that car had been, apart from Lando's five second penalty. Yeah, uh, th- and I mean, Piastri, Piastri was racing and and take, overtaking people and driving, and they've made good progress. They still haven't scored a point in Canada since 2014, which is not good. Yeah, but maybe it's just track specific. But I thought the team did put. I, they've saved his job. I think we can officially retire him from the list, rather than retiring him from the job. Um, uh yeah. I mean, time could still tell, but I think for now he is safe. I think it was going to take a lot to get him out anyway, and I think for now he is safe. Yeah. Shall we move on to between race drama? Of course. Uh, the first item that we've got here, I think, is funny in the context of happened into the race. Uh, George says that three drivers on the dra- on the grid lack spatial awareness. The question is, though, does that include himself? Uh, are we talking about our opinions? Because yes. Are we talking about his opinion? No, because George does no wrong in George's eyes. I see. But maybe maybe he does have enough self awareness. Maybe deep down he knows it really is him that is one of those three drivers. The real question is, is who are the other two drivers? If you make it one of them, him. Uh, I assume Max is one. Okay, that would make sense after backing. Right. And just just in general. Um, probably not Lewis. Nope. I don't think it's anybody towards the back of the grid. Oh, maybe Valtteri. From, they, they ran into each other in Imola. True, true. He's still holding an axe to grind, despite the fact that he, he came out on top off that. And uh, Guan Yu Zhou from Silverstone? I'm thinking of people who yes. have crashed into yes. George Russell. That was totally not George Russell's fault. Wink, yeah, wink. no, I think those are the, probably the three. The real three he was talking about was Max, uh, Guan Yu Zhou, and um, Mr. Bottas. So, yeah. Uh, this is, I think, especially funny with the wall today, which I have more commentary shortly. Uh, second item we've got here is uh, apparently, I thought this was actually quite interesting, uh, that Franz Tost, uh, soon to be ex team principal of Alpha Tori, wanted Mick Schumacher and not. Uh, Nick DeBreeze. Um 
in the car for the Alpha Tori, which I thought was actually really curious take given the fact that Mick is a known quantity and Nick was not. Maybe it was just a misspoken and somebody misheard him because Mick and Nick sound quite the same, especially if you've got an accent. Yeah, I mean, we went from a driver who's proven to destroy race cars to one who is now destroying race cars. <laughs> do do we really think that was Mick's fault or do we think that was the Hass's fault? I mean, that was Hass's reason for dropping him was he, he that with the cost cap, he was costing them too much money in the uh, Destructor Championship. Uh, now I got to look up the 2022 Destructor Championship. Yeah, Mick was clearly the uh, most destructive driver last year, followed by Nicholas Latifi. Oh, that is not a proud championship to have won, especially when you're when you're ahead of Nicholas Latifi. That's pretty bad. So maybe this maybe this is the right call. For, uh, the the Red Bull sporting team made the right choice and picked Debris because he's bent the car, but he hasn't burnt the car. I think he's not even crashed it as much as Yuki did in his first season. Yuki was a solid ninth last year in the in the deconstructor championships. Yeah, 2021 he bent it a lot more. Uh, so, uh, next item on our Between Ways drama. Uh, Lewis and Shakira apparently have reached the meet-cute stage of world domination. Uh, per the people, the headline was Shakira and Lewis Hamilton are in the early stages of dating. It's fun and flirty, says Source. Uh, I think this is uh, the fact that it has bubbled up to the level of a People article. Uh, ironically, under the music section of entertainment, according to this screenshot, I'm not entirely sure whether that is because it's Shakira or because Lewis is a... Is a uh, uh, his own bona fide musical uh, uh, entertainment star. Uh, well, I would have to say I, I'm going to guess uh, people does not have a, an athlete section. There, I think, are more music and entertainment. They must have a sports section for all the footballers. Uh, not the American people. I don't know about. Oh, I don't know whether this was American or British. It has PM in it, so who knows? Um, but I think that's interesting. Uh, you know, let's let's see how this goes. I have a theory about this in my spicy hot takes. Um, it is also important to be noted that apparently Tom Cruise's ego has been dented by Lewis Ham- Hamilton shacking up with Shakira. Um, and given that uh, Tom Cruise and Lewis Hamilton apparently were BFFs for the Formula One movie that they were making, uh, or that was being made, I wonder what this means. Uh, and especially you don't want to get on the wrong side of Tom Cruise. He'll fly a plane at you or just l- jump out of it and attack you because he does all his own stunts. I mean, obviously, wish wish Lewis and Shakira the best, but uh, is this just an angle for uh, for Lewis to get another featuring on a uh, on an album? Are we about to see the return of uh, Are we going to see the return of uh, Shakira featuring XDNA? I think there's a good chance. Who did he feature with previously? Uh, Christina Aguilera. Okay. Uh, next item. Uh, Helmut Marco keeps opening his mouth, and he should probably stop. Um, uh, he's been doing this for years. He's not going to stop now. I know, but it feels like it's getting particularly bad at the moment. Maybe it's because there's not a lot else going on, and whenever he opens his mouth, it's a good thing to be reporting on. I, I um, wouldn't be surprised if he's, like, pre-recorded, like, certain things, so, like, after he dies, we still get Helmet Marco hot takes. Yes, that I could see that being a believable thing, you know, like, dripping them out slowly, but surely he's recorded a number of them, and they just pick whichever one happens to fit the narrative. Exactly, yeah. For that. Uh, the two that particularly popped up this week for some context is uh, the story that he apparently forbade Max Verstappen from taking part in the Nürburgring Red Bull demonstration uh, track thing that Sebastian Vettel is driving at. Uh, I, which I kind of under, I understand. I don't blame him for it. that. <laughs> no, I don't blame him for that either. It's the fact that he keeps opening up about it. Uh, and then the second point was uh, he talked about the pressure having been relieved on Perez uh, in effectively, but like Perez isn't a real person who has feelings too. Yeah. Uh, to, to go back to the Nürburgring, to be fair to Max, on the other hand, he could have the driver championship wrapped up by the time we they hit the, the exploratory day on the Nürburgring. They and, could. Yeah, they and could. Then, and then, it and then maybe he gets, to go, he gets to go drive. That's how we get Danny Rick. It's Danny Rick and Perez because uh, Max managed to break his foot while driving around the Nürburgring. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, still no Lewis contract. Uh, especially this is most interesting because Toto at the end of Barcelona was the last race. Um, Toto was saying that the contract was days away. We will be signing it imminently. Um, but here we are with Lewis a week later saying it is at least a month away. There is there is more going on here than meets the eye. I would like to apologize to if we have any German listeners or Austrian listeners uh, for that. Um, I I think this is a nothing burger. Because um, we, we talked a little bit about this on the last episode of I don't think that... like like. There's a trend of when drivers get a contract on the next race, they drive like crap. 
right? Mm-hmm. So Lewis is putting this off till like the summer break. They'll get it done in like sometime during the summer break. There's no races to worry about. And then he doesn't have to have a race where he, I don't know, smacks the wall in Montreal and rides last for a while and ends up retiring the car. That would never happen. Well, didn't uh, George got his uh, George got his contract, right? No, I don't think he renewed it because I think he's already still in term for another year. Oh, I thought I think his I contract. Thought George... uh, June fifth, George Russell's Mercedes contract extension uh, to be extended. His team locks him in. June fifth. Oh, they did do it on the break in, in between the last two races. They have extended George to twenty twenty five. Did they do that before Barcelona? Uh. June yes, 5th. they did. They did. And he did terrible at Barcelona, did he not? Ooh, Daily Express. Lew- George Russell may force Lewis Hamilton to compromise on his massive Mercedes contract. Ooh, now it's about the money. Right. I'm pretty sure last time we went around on this, like in 2021, was it 2021? Whenever it was. And Lewis was like, well, I'll sign for a lot less money as long as you put it into something worthwhile. Though they can't put it into the car, they have a cost cap. True, but they they put it into um, diversity and inclusion initiatives and um, helping underrepresented minorities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They started a whole initiative and put some money into Mission Forty Four, blah blah blah, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All right, that, that's worthwhile. Okay, race recap. Uh, I thought this is a great start by Lewis. Looking at the replay, everybody had about the same uh, reaction time, which is pretty good because Lewis can sometimes be a bit slow. Uh, but I do wonder what happened to Alonso's car because it seemed like it got bogged down and it didn't really deliver for Nando. No, Nando definitely had the uh, the worst start in the second phase, as they, they always talk about on the commentary. Yeah, it was surprising. And uh, I thought Lewis did a good job getting in front, even despite that he got a best start. That was pretty good. Uh, I thought George was real close. Uh, but then moving on to George, the question here is, does he believe that the wall should have gotten out of his way? Uh, and did the wall lack spatial awareness given that he feels that many other drivers do uh, especially when he's at fault um i think this is a real question i think it's also important to note that while he apologized to the team he chose not to uh, apologize to the wall and shows a lack of respect for the things that he drives into i mean has he ever apologized to the things he drives into be it drivers or walls no never uh so yeah i thought it was a (laughs) I thought it was a bit of a schoolboy error that he did that. He clearly clearly screwed it up like one and a half corners beforehand. And I kind of expect better from George, but such is life. Meanwhile, Max hits the same curb and laughs saying, ha ha, I hit the curb wrong. He did. Did you also, I believe Alonso also hit the same wall, but he just made a spark and then drove quicker. Yeah, that was, uh, that might've been the cause of uh, some of his brake issue that they were having. It could have, that is a good point. That is a good point. I, I eagerly await the, uh, moment by moment an analysis breakdown on one of the various formula one websites alonzo thought he could have won if it weren't for his brakes slash the lifting coast i i i can't agree with this i don't i think he may have been closer but there was a massive gap and i don't think max was really trying he was five seconds behind on the safety car he was five seconds behind before he really started to drop back uh and yeah how much was max really pushing because like perez started to drop back on that second medium tire stint uh before pitting for softs to try to go for fastest lap and getting it uh meanwhile max was just like yeah i'll just chill here he did miss his third consecutive grand slam not getting the fastest lap but in indeed i I was trying to work out when i was watching the times change at the end on because i reckoned he was going to put trump at the fastest lap in on lap 68 he clearly tried because he pulled out a big lead over Alonso, like he added an extra two seconds. But I think it was like, we won't pull Perez in because we want to let Max try getting it. But then when Max couldn't get it, they then sent Perez out to go and do what he always does, which is at the very last lap of the race, put some sticky tires on and, and you know, not try that hard, but then go get the fastest lap. Yeah, I think it was also probably a case of, you know, do you get a DRS for a lap or something like that to be able to help it out and older medium tires. Either way, I think Max drove a, a great race. Uh, he's up to 225 consecutive laps led if he leads every race in Austria or every lap in Austria, because I'm assuming the sprint laps don't count. Um, he will be like eight laps behind Ascari for the record for most consecutive laps led. It's 304 is the record. Where does Lewis rank in this list? I don't think uh, I had it pulled up. Lewis is not on this list. That is surprising. Yes. It's Ascari with 304 from like the 92 Belgian to the 92 Dutch. Then um, 
this is pretty fun. Uh, Senna did 264 between the 88 British Grand Prix and the 88 Italian Grand Prix. Then Senna again with 237 between the 89 uh, San Marino Grand Prix and the 89 U.S. Grand Prix. Uh, what, and then Nigel Mansell at 235 and Sebastian Vettel at 205. So Max will move ahead of Sebastian Vettel at this point in time. Interesting. I, try, I wonder what that says about Lewis and his career to have not had the, the consecutive laps led. Well, I think it, it's also... Is it Merck's uh, strategy? I think is it's it Merck's because strategy because they always prioritize the first car, right? So how many times was he leading in a race with Valtteri close behind? They pit Lewis, then they pit Val or they pit Nico and then Val or Valtteri. And just he does... So somebody leads for a lap while he's in the pits. And then, yeah. So I think it's just kind of a... It, it's one of those kind of, I think, oddball records of like everything has to go your way. Yes. Yes. You, I think you need a favorable win from the rest of your team, I think, as well per your point that you've just made yeah uh and then on top of that like you know how many we've seen times before where you know somebody stays out and is leading for the safety car while everybody else pits and then 10 laps after the safety car they're falling back through the field so it, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a no nothing record compared to like say um race victories in a row but it's it's fun I, i'm always a fan of the random records it is very much a baseball like stat yes it, it's the quality starts of a uh, of Formula One. Uh, okay, next item. Uh, Williams took a bunch of updates, and they seem to have worked. Is this the beginning of the Williams resurgence? I hope so. I mean, it's a good blue car. I think Alex is a great driver. Uh, he was definitely my vote for driver of the day today, and he won driver of the day, and I think he deserved it. He also recently had his contract renewed. So put, is the curse gone? I mean, is Alex ever cursed? Yes, he drove a Red Bull. That's fair. Just to quickly touch on Alex again, like, I mean, uh, what James had the comment of the classic uh, Alex Albon defending, which we haven't heard before, but thinking back on it, there is some very classic Alex Albon defending of like, I'm just going to lead this DRS train around in my slippery car and finish in the points. <laughs> like, he's done this multiple times now. And, and he seems to be able to do it with a certain calmness that I think other drivers in a similar position would not be. Like, he accepts his fate in that the car won't go forward, but he can stop it from going backwards. Yeah, he's he's like, this thing is slippery. I'm just going to park it on every apex. Because, like, you watch some of the, him coming out of, like, the hairpin down the back straight, and he just, like, parked it in such a way that Akon could not get a good acceleration compared to what he got. And then even with DRS, he just wasn't, caught up by the time they hit the chicane so it was just this uh, alex knew exactly where to put his car throughout the, the whole lap and yeah it's one of those of i don't care what my lap time is anymore you're just not coming by is it maybe that the thing that really has saved williams is alex because he's given them the confidence that they can have a driver that will um, put them in the places where maybe the car isn't justified in being but that it could reach for Versus the other second drivers that they, they've had in the past, Nicholas Latifi, uh, who has been unable to to do that. I mean, I think George had done it a few times, but I think the car was truly, truly terrible then. But they have an okay, not an okay car. They have a car that that is closer to the field than maybe it has been in previous years. And Alex is really the thing that's giving them the confidence and bringing up the morale. I mean, I always think that, uh, that Alex got kind of a, a very short straw on the Red Bull side of things. And, you know, when he sat out a year, I'm happy to see him in the Williams. William, he's probably, like, the best driver Williams could have ever gotten that's not, like, part of some sort of driver academy situation because, you know, people were didn't want to take a risk on him after the whole Red Bull situation, and I totally understand. But, like, yeah, you can't think of, like, your driver combination being Logan Sargent and Nicholas Latifi. Like... <laughs> That's not going to go well. <laughs> oh, that would have been terrible. It's a bit like Haas, really, because I think they've got they've got a similar problem of two not good enough drivers. Yeah, but I I think I think Alex is definitely for I mean he deserves a spot on the F1 grid. I'm happy to see him get it. Uh, you know, at Williams moving forward could be good. It would be amazing to see what Alex could do in a top flight car again. Like, is maybe that the correct replacement for Perez? You put in Danny Ricciardo for the rest of the season just because he's right there. And then you get ready to take um, Alex Albon by him out of his Williams contract and put him back in again. And he's willing to accept his position as a second player. I, I don't know, because I, I think some cases of what hurt Alex last time was that car can so, sometimes be so set up for Max 
that like you either have to know how to drive it or you don't. And I think that's one thing where like Danny Rick's already been in the situation where they're starting to set up the car for Max. And he, so he, I think has a somewhat of a similar driving style. I could see Alex being more of a replacement for like Lewis when Lewis finally decides to, to roll away and be partnered with his BFF, George Russell. And then they will no longer be BFFs. I mean, what is Mercedes for if not ruining friendships? True. True. Who are the friendship did they remove? They uh, re- ruin. Uh, Hamilton and Rosberg. No, no, but you, yeah, that's that's one. Who else is have they have they hurt, or is that just so big it doesn't matter about any others? I mean, that's just, that's just so big. That's the next thing. I see. It okay. didn't ruin. A, if anything, it brought uh, Lewis and Valtteri closer together. They're now best friends. True, true. Do you think it brought Schumacher and Rosberg closer together? Uh, I don't know. Great question to ask. Uh, we will never know the answer, sadly. Uh, I have I haven't answered for you, but I don't want it in the podcast. Okay, great. We'll talk about that afterwards. You can text that to me. Uh, okay, next item on the race recap. <laughs> Ferrari called the right strap for once, and it seemed to actually pay off for them. I know we talked a little bit about this early earlier, but I think it was... The question really is, did Ferrari whiff it at the safety car, and then it just happened to look out for them? Or did they have a really meaningful plan where they're like, we understand what this car and the tyre mean together, we know what we should do and we're going to stay out. Like if it was intentional, man, that's a great call from them. If it was just the fact that Ferrari whiffed it and it netted out, okay, that's not a good call. And I don't think, I, I just don't know which one it was. I will say they lucked into this good call because of their terrible calls on Saturday. I see. I see. So essentially thinking back to qualifying, which we haven't spent much time talking about, if any, um, you know, Alex Albon to go back to him again, um, Slapped on the soft tires at just the right time. Fastest oh, in Q, fastest was... in Q2 was great. But on on that in lap, Charles or on that out lap, Charles was saying, it's too dry for enters. We should put softs on. Do you want do you want me to do this lap? Or should we just come in and put softs on? And Javi was, no, no, no. Uh put we're gonna we want to do a banker lap and then we'll come in and put softs on. And uh to Javi's credit. If he gets one other job at Ferrari, it should be the Ferrari weatherman because he had the right radar calls. He said it's going to start raining heavier in six to seven minutes. And sure enough, with about that much time left in the session, it was raining heavier. I mean, Javi nailed the radar calls. And it's interesting that he couldn't correlate that with how much time it takes to like do an out lap, do a timed lap, do an in lap, change tires, do an out lap, do a time lap. And like, oh crap, now we're at six or seven minutes with heavier rain. So... So, yeah, uh, but you end up in this situation where then because of that and uh, Carlos Sainz was able to put somewhat of a lap together on the softs better than than Charles was. I think he was ahead of him, too, so he would have had slightly better track position or track conditions. Um, but they started at the back or at the back of the top 10, essentially, because uh, somehow Sainz only got a three place grid penalty for blocking four cars. Um, and not not and- just blocking four cars blocking them repeatedly in exactly the same way in exactly the same place yeah it's ridiculous yeah lovely um but i think they realized that there was that drs train that was forming before the safety car they knew that it was going to be a struggle if they stayed in that train and so they said well let's just we think we can eke out the media they don't think i mean what canada's somewhat easy on tires but also not like because it's yeah, but it's the, it's the softest range in the in the tire range. So like it's not the most deg track of all time. So they're like, okay, we're just going to suffer through a long stint on the mediums. Kind of eke our use our pace to eke away of ahead of everybody because we knew on Friday in practice they were fast runners. They were on pace with the Red Bull. So we'll just eke away in front of everybody and then put for hards and and hold this position. So I think they more lucked into it than uh than uh Galaxy brained their way into it. Yeah, I think I'd agree with that. That seems a, a plausible conclusion. And if you had made better calls on Saturday, you wouldn't have to do these sort of calls on a Sunday. And then they'd have made some dodgy calls and it would all have been the same at the end of the day. Probably. Okay, I, I, will, I will subscribe to that theory. Uh, the interesting thing, though, is uh, they did not let signs go after Charles at all. I, w- I was very confused by that. And I didn't really understand the motivation. I didn't think that c- science was getting that close anyway. And then they made the call like it was like trying to make Charles happy because they want to keep him. I have a theory. They were concerned about Sergio. And when Charles is being pressured by a Red Bull behind, he puts it into the wall. 
<laughs> so if we keep signs behind Charles, we have a better defender who will then prevent uh, Perez from passing a Ferrari because signs can defend better than Charles can without binning it. I will subscribe to that theory, and I am worried that, that is way too plausible. I think it's good. I think it is too. Uh, okay, so this is this is rather rather than a race recap, it's more a commentary on the race. Uh, I thought the midfield on track is way too close. Uh, there is no differentiation between everything after the top three and maybe the bottom two, um, which means that they can't find the weakness of another t- uh, in a different part of the track relative to other cars and then exploit it. And this means that they just go around and around in a train until they get tired and somebody bins it. I mean, luckily we have two top flight cars that are constantly out of position, like giving us some sort of uh, battle through the midfield. True. Uh, it just bothers me when you're looking at like, you know, you're 15 laps in and everything's separated by under a second and everybody's just DRSing. And it's not like, you know, four cars. It's like 12 cars. And you just look at that shot down the, the, the one of, you know, one of the various straights in Montreal and you're just like, this is ridiculous because nobody's going to, nobody's going to pop out because you've been doing it for 10 laps already and it's just going to keep going and going. I just, I feel like there's something that needs to be done from, a, from the perspective of the cars to improve this. If I could make one rule change, it would be that consecutive cars are not allowed to have DRS. Well, how, explain how you would apply that. So, uh, so only like, so you have like a leading car, like. Alex Albon, for instance, right? And then you have Ocon behind him. He gets DRS. Lando is, is within a second of Ocon, but he's a consecutive car, so he does not get DRS. And then whoever was behind Lando now does not have DRS, so he gets DRS. I see. So you, I got it. I got it. I got it. You can only get, have one level of DRS. Yes. I see. I, I, could, I could buy that. I, would you make an exclusion that if two cars got within one second of the car in front, so that if you had car A and then car B was 0.3 and then car C was again 0.3 for a total of less than one second that they would then get that both get DRS at that no, point. No, it's consecutive. It's who's ahead at the, at the, at the, at the detection zone. The other thing is like, just give everybody like 90 seconds of DRS and you can use it whenever you want. Yeah. I do think that's an interesting way to, to spice up DRS. Cause I think the way it has today, it just, it, when it works for some cars, it works really well. Uh, slight tangent it seems that whatever uh, red bull did to get good drs aston martin now seem to have because i think that drs improvement was actually pretty big relative to the rest of the performance of the car um but yeah you have people who just drs like and it works for them but then everybody else gets stuck and it doesn't help anybody at all like it it doesn't even achieve the goal that you thought it was going to achieve because everybody's just drsing everybody else it's ridiculous you you've re-equalized the field in a way that is not helpful to anybody right so either we do like 90 seconds of drs per race use it when you want None of this, like, one second thing. Because if you imagine, like, what Hamilton was on that charge towards Fernando Alonso, let's say he hadn't used his DRS at all or anything like that and just, like, starts pumping it in on, like, every single straight, every single bit. Oh, that would have been great. Uh, would you allow it only in DRS zones or would you just be like, you can turn DRS anywhere around the track? Nope, it you can turn it on anywhere zone. anywhere you want. Yeah, no, okay. I, yep. I will subscribe to that. Tur- turned off uh, by heavy braking or push of the button. Yep. That makes a bunch of sense. I can subscribe to that. Uh, so the last item in race recap is uh, Perez and his terrible performance. Uh, specifically for me here is what are you doing, boy? You're going to cost Red Bull the World Champion, World Constructors Championship if you keep doing this. I, I don't think it's that bad. <laughs> really? If his performance keeps like this, there is a good chance that the Lewis and Russell duo, assuming Russell doesn't put it in the wall and Lewis doesn't forget how to drive, they could very easily creep up and put be very close to putting it in danger maybe they wouldn't actually pull it off but it's gonna get close it could get close but it's also one of those things of uh as bad as perez is being he's not gonna stop scoring points it's just gonna be like five and not 20 or 18 uh and then like i think they said at the very end of the race this is like the largest gap in the constructors championship we've ever had this early in the season really yeah I'm surprised by that. Yeah, me too. Especially with especially with Perez's poor performance, or with uh, what the the 2014 Mercedes package. Yeah, I'm kind of surprised by that. But I I think Perez needs to needs to look out for that. Like less so, he should be thinking about beating Max at this point. He needs to make sure he doesn't lose the team or cause it to be too tight for the team. Because can you imagine lo- losing the World Champ- Truck Constructors Championship to Mercedes so that they have it nine times? That would oof oof. That would yeah. look bad. I, I mean, on the other hand, you also have Aston Martin who are being pulled along in the Constructors' World Championship by Fernando Alonso. 
Yes, and that's like it's ridiculous. Uh, I, I think that they are also in danger of losing either first if Perez continues to be crap, or second uh, if Perez doesn't turn out being crap because of Lance. And that I just, I just, it blows my mind that there isn't something more going on there. There, uh, Aston Martin have a hundred and fifty-four points in the constructor championship. Fernando Alonso has hundred and seventeen points in the st- driver standings. Uh, Lance Lance is down in eighth with thirty-seven. Fernando is in I'm surprised, third. I'm surprised he's even gotten that many. Fernando's in third, catching Perez, and will likely pass Perez if Perez's performance keeps up. He is uh, what Fernando is nine points down on Sergio. Haas went backwards. It's not surprising. It, that's what they do. As I made the point last week, I think they would be better off paying for more expensive drivers so that when they get to the front, when they qualify well, they can then capitalize on that. But they don't. And they keep having these drivers who don't seem to be able to race. I don't, I don't think it's the car. I think it's the drivers. I mean, Nico qualified well until he decided to keep his foot in it during a red flag. Well, that's how he got the second position by keeping his foot in it. Um, but yeah, I think I think Haas is doing themselves a disservice by not having better drivers. I really do. How did Yuki do? Uh, he was doing badly, but then he kind of worked his way up the field. That kind of makes sense. I think, can't remember where he ended. He was out at the points. Uh, he was 16th. Oh, that, oh no, that's yeah. qualifying. He was 14th. And he was down at the back. He was last for a while after. He stopped on like lap two for a bunch for a set of hearts. I like it. The soft, hard, hard strategy. Yeah. Uh, okay, should we go on to spicy takes and rumors? Uh, these are both from me. Uh, the first one is, I think, and we probably should do a recap as we get close or get back from the summer break. Um, but for the think for the first time in quite a number of years, there is going to be some driver swaps on track this year. Uh, specifically, I think the three most at risk are Perez for somebody, Ricardo we've talked about. Uh, Lance for someone, I have no idea who, uh, and Nick for literally anyone else. Um, I think there is a grave danger that that could happen for each of those. I think Lance is probably the least likely, but we've got, we've got what, four more races before the summer break? And I think there's going to be something that's going to happen between one of those three. Is the relationship between Aston Martin and Mercedes good enough that Mick Schumacher gets tossed in for Lance? You know, that's really interesting, given that supposedly that was Vettel's choice, was that that was the... Um, that was the hope that Vettel had when he gave up his seat and instead Fernando took it. But I think yeah. that's interesting. Is that is that Vettel's brain or Vettel's heart, though? Because he, he, I mean, he was... His heart. His heart, clearly. That's all he is now. He, I think Vettel is nothing but heart. Um, but I think there is a distinct possibility, and I like that theory, that maybe Lance gets swapped out for, um, especially if he hurts his hands again. Oh, sounds a bit suspicious. Uh, I think that could be something that could happen. Yeah, uh, just just when everybody starts inviting, when Lance gets a bunch of uh, mountain biking invitations over the summer break, we'll know. Uh, we'll know the we'll, we'll know L plan is in effect. Normally, I'd suggest that Fernando Alonso is about to invite him on a bike race and then shove him over and break him. But Lance is no, no, not competing. It is in Fernando's best interest to make sure nobody who is able to drive a car gets put into that seat because then he doesn't have to deal with the problem. Somebody, I, I think I sent it to you. I, I saw a comment somewhere along the lines of uh, the reason why we've seen nice Fernando as a teammate is because he is trying to like coach the uh, the the owner's kid along. So for so when they do, if if Lance ever does start to become uh, super Lance, um, that that Fernando will still get favorable treatment in the team. Why would that happen? Well, because like the whole the thing is, if if Lance is suddenly on the same pace as Fernando, which I don't think he is for a minute capable of doing, um, that then all the favorable upgrades and favorable mechanics will be on Lance's side of the garage because it's it's the owner's kid. But if Fernando's like, oh, he should, I'm the good mentor and coaching him along and helping him out, then there's enough goodwill there that uh, that maybe I it doesn't see, happen. I see. I yeah. see. Win, win, win favor and then cash it in when when the time comes. I yes. think that makes sense. Because because we can't think of uh, Fernando Alonso with be, doing anything without some sort of ulterior motive. Okay, next item, last item on my spicy hot takes, unless you end up with one. Uh, Lewis's step up in form is not about the car. It's about how he has found a happy place, either with his long-term future or his bay. Um, You can correlate this because there hasn't been the same step up in performance from George, who has now been out-qualified by Lewis for the the last three races, uh, which is very strange. You just thought that if the car got better, George would have got better with it too. I just think Lewis likes a... 
I just think Lewis likes a good thick car with side pods. <laughs> uh, no comment. This is a family-friendly podcast. All right, so, uh, so let's uh, let's talk about uh, Austria. Well, we got a sprint race. That's could be interesting. I hate sprint races. I hate them. They're they end up just kind of boring. Yes, because if you bend it, you get screwed. Well, at least it's no longer your qualifying position. True, you do that, but you, you bend it and you bend the car, and therefore, given that the real points are really at play on on Sunday, you don't want to bend your car on a on a uh, Saturday, especially if you if you're vibing with your car, you definitely don't want to bend it. It's just like an extended test session, really. Yeah, it's very strange. It's I, I know what they were trying to do with it, but it's not working. Anyway, I'm not excited about that. All right. Well, anyway, uh, what we had, um, Merck will drop back at Austria, and Alonso will get his win. Um, no, I, I know this is what you said, but when are you going to admit that these Mercedes upgrades work? I, I will, when they successfully get to the front and Austria, and not through luck and because somebody else broke it, then I think it's time for me to accept that the upgrades worked. But I think it's a, I, I think it's a good chance that Alonso might get his win. I, I think we'll see the same podium we just saw in Montreal. I think it'll be Max, Alonso, and Lewis. I, I, I think that's it. Would we you might... predict the same order? Uh, I'll say actually, I, I'd, I'd flip the Aston Martin and the Mercedes. I think it's, I think it's going to suit the Merck a little bit better than it suits the Aston. If, if Lewis is telling the truth that it really was the, the uh, slow speed corners that caused them issues, because there's much more high speed corners at Austria than Canada. Okay. I'm, we could have, I, I can believe that. We could have a Perez return to form or the no. other prediction of Perez disappoints. Yes. Uh, unquestionably. How's um, he done at Austria in the past? Is that his track or no? I don't know. I'm going to have to look that up. Let's see. He retired in 2022. Was that his fault or not? No, they fixed the car by that point. He was sixth in 2021. Yeah, so he didn't do very good. Oh, yeah, 2021 was where he had to come in together with... Um, he drove into Norris because he was trying to show off how good he was. Right. Uh, in in the Austrian and Styrian Grand Prix in 2020, he was sixth both times. So it sounds like he's just going to finish sixth. That seems like where he ends up at Austria. Uh, and so when you add in the fact that he's not driving very well at the moment, he's probably going to be 7th or 8th. <laughs> no, I'll leave him at 6th. I think <laughs> I'll leave I'll leave Perez at 6th. But that still opens the door for, what, what George? So who are, the, who, are the, who are the two in front? I'd say George and Charles. No. George, George and, and Sainz. Sainz. I can see that as well. Yeah. Charles will be behind Perez either because he bent it or because Perez scared him. Yeah, scare us, uh, press scares them into a gravel trap, and then there we go. All right, well, uh, once again, thanks for listening to Tinfoil Helmets. We are awaiting your feedback and own conspiracy theories, so feel free to write in at tin, or feedback at tinfoilhelmets.com uh, and let us know your own uh, thoughts on what's going on, what we could do better, uh, what the drivers could do better. And uh, also, don't forget to uh, listen, like, rate, subscribe, tell your friends, because we're not telling anybody about this podcast anymore. It's up to you.